Give that some thought. What would life be worth if it were not for the fact that Jesus Christ is alive and well? And to just have an existence on this planet and that ended everything would certainly be an exercise in futility. And every day I, every day I live, obviously, I get closer home. And I get more homesick every day, too. <laughs> Sharing your faith effectively. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now, Mark, that's, that's Mark's rendition of the Great Commission, which we're going to look at in a little more detail later uh, in the book of Matthew because it, more detail is given there. But there are some who insist that the Great Commission was given to the apostles and was intended only for them. But both logic and the Bible tell us otherwise. Logically, if the apostles had faithfully fulfilled the mission of preaching the gospel to, to, to all the world, not that they could have done so, but if they had done that, and then those whom they reached had never told another living soul, where would the church be today? It wouldn't be. There'd be no church. That's the, the basis for that statement we often hear. The church is always just one generation from extinction. If we fail to pass it along to the next generation, the church will die. And that's part of the reason the church is struggling in America. A survey taken about six or eight years ago indicated that 70% plus of the churches in America were either dead or dying. They're going nowhere, doing nothing. And, but biblically, the, the Great Commission is even more powerful than that. The commission was given after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and just days before the church was born. And we know it was the responsibility of the apostles to lay the doctrinal foundation for the church. Paul, addressed that the <coughs> Paul addre addressing the church in Ephesus wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, Paul was not saying here that, excuse me, Mark was not saying here that, no, it wasn't Paul, it was Paul. Paul was not saying here that the church is built on the persons of the apostles and prophets. Because that's not factual. And he would have been contradicting himself had he said so, because he, he, he wrote in 1 Corinthians 3.11, 3, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the foundation of the church is the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing, and nothing other than him. But it was the, the apostles who taught us the truth of the gospel relating to the fact that Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church. And they, they began the building of the church upon that foundation. Now the question is, what was the doctrine of the apostles upon which the church was to be built and is continuing to be built today? And we find the answer to that in Matthew 28, verse 20. Jesus instructed his disciples there, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, what all had Jesus commanded them? Among all the other things he had commanded them was go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So the responsibility falls not just upon the apostles, but upon the church, the entire body of Christ. So it's as much our responsibility as it was the responsibility of the apostles to reach the world for Jesus Christ and to make the effort to, to get the gospel out to every living soul. So the chief responsibility of the apostles remains and will remain the responsibility of the church. Now, let's begin with the great commandment. I didn't say commission, I said commandment. The great commandment is found in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is, you shall love your neighbor 
as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, think about that. With all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, does that leave anything out? He wants us sold out, right? He wants, to love, he wants us loving him with every, every ounce of our being, our entire essence. Now, there's an interesting aside here. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 is quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, which is a part of the Shema found in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. And that is a sacred prayer of the Jews that faithful Jews pray morning and night every day. And this is just a silent reminder of the close relationship that exists between the church and Israel. And having said that, let me clarify, though. If we're to understand the Bible correctly, we must for always maintain a clear distinction between Israel and the church. The church is not spiritual Israel. Did you hear that clearly? The church is not spiritual Israel. The church is one entity and Israel is another. God dealt with Israel in the Old Testament as a nation. God's dealing with the church as individuals. And the, the, the means by which he's dealing with us is entirely different. He dealt with them using the law. He's, he's dealing with us in pure grace unadulterated. And that, that doesn't mean that they were saved by the law. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness, you remember? Okay. And we're, we're saved how? We believe God and we're, it's counted to us for righteousness. The only difference is the content of what we believe. Abraham didn't have the knowledge we do of, a, of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But whatever he knew, he believed. And God gets counted that to him as righteousness. Now... We, we, do owe, we do, however, owe a great debt to the Jewish people. And I say that because uh, God, they have been used by God to give us the Bible. The Bible is a Jewish book. And they've also been used by God to give us a Savior. Our Savior is Jewish. And I, I know that generally it's generally believed that that and, and taught even, I was, in fact, I was taught in Bible college and seminary that Luke was a Gentile. However, neither the Bible nor history will substantiate that. The evidence is very, very thin to suggest that Luke was a Gentile. Careful investigation reveals the fact that the evidence is so thin, in fact, as to be unbelievable, in my estimation. Uh, in reality, his Gentile origin is actually based on tradition rather than evidence. And to that fact, add to that fact, that if you, if you count the pages that Luke wrote in the book of Luke and the book of Acts, he wrote more than half the New Testament. More than Paul and John he wrote over half the New Testament. And as Gentiles, we might like to think, hey, one of us gave us over half the New Testament. We might like to think that. That might be a comfortable thought for us. The only real evidence, though, is Luke is known as a Gentile rather than Jew Jewish. But th that could be, I believe, it doesn't mean Luke was... That could mean also that Luke was a Hellenistic Jew. The fact his name was Gentile, Luke is a Gentile name. But you see, during the dispersion, during the, 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 the time when they had been exiled out of, out of Jerusalem and out of Israel, they'd moved into Greece and they had been, been brought into, fully brought into the Greek culture. They'd adopted the Greek culture, including the Greek language even. And they were referred to as Hellenistic Jews. And the Hellenistic Jews, many of them, had Gentile names because they'd grown up in it, but were born and been grown up in a Gentile world outside of Israel. And so it's, there's no reason for, to, to believe that, the, that Luke was not simply a Hellenistic Jew. And, but getting back to the great commandment, 
we find that it's actually twofold. It's actually two great commandments. First, Christians are to love God. Secondly, we're to love our neighbors. And in both commandments, the verb love, verb love is translated from the same form of agape, which literally speaks of purposing the good of others without counting the cost to yourself. In other words, regardless of what it, it costs me, regardless of how difficult it is for me, regardless of how uncomfortable it is for me, regardless of how repulsive it might be to me to love some people, that's my responsibility. And if you're a child of God, that is all of our responsibilities. To love people, not because of what they are, not because of who they are, but because God said so. God told us to. He gave us that responsibility. And you understand, if the, if the world, if the unsaved world around us in the community we, li we live in and elsewhere is ever going to understand the love of God, they have to see it in us. They have to see it through us because God's no longer present on this earth bodily. So they need to see the love of God in his people, you and me. And so these two, these two elements of the great commandment are incumbent upon all of us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in both commandments, this verb is the same. Now, it's from that form of, of love which can only be measured in terms of actions, which prompts, a, a, actions that prompt emotions, yes. But love gives birth to the actions, not the emotions. The emotions are the product of the actions. When we do right, we feel right. When you don't feel, do, do right, you don't feel right. And guess what? You're not supposed to. Did you, did you hear about this man who went to the psychologist? Psychiatrist, excuse me. And he said, Doctor, I, I just have this horrible, horrible inferiority complex. The doctor said, well, let me give you some tests. He gave him a whole battery of tests. And he came back out and he said, well, I got some bad news for you. You are inferior. <laughs> you know? And we have to understand, you know, God didn't save us because we were so good. God didn't save us because he saw something that's undesirable in us. And we'll get to that just a little later. But in both these commandments, this love is, is our responsibility. And that when we do right, when we love people as we're supposed to, it will make us feel good about ourselves. For example, God's love for man is measured by what? God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. God's love for mankind is measured. Greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for what? His friends. But Jesus laid down his life for his enemies. We were his enemies. And we read in John, 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, By this the love of God is manifested in this, that God has sent his, sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. And not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the complete satisfaction for our sins. That love is not, not motivated by any quality God saw in man. That love is not motivated by any good that God saw in man. Not that God motivated by any value God saw in man. I've heard teachers and even preachers make the comment that God saw great worth in us in our unsaved condition. No, in our unsaved condition, we were worthless. He's the one who gave us worth. He's the one that gave us value. He's the one that gave us meaning. He's the one that gave us reason in this world. And so love is not motivated by the inequality God saw in man. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. In other words, Christ died for us in spite of ourselves, not because of ourselves. In spite of the fact that we were rebels against God, he loved us and gave himself for us. And God made a totally independent choice to love us in spite of ourselves. That was a sovereign choice made by God, and there was no cause for it other than the very nature of God himself. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says, The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
That's a part of the very essence, the very nature of God. It's one of the attributes of God. And if you strip God of love, then he ceases to be what he is. He's something less than the God that he is. And it's not mere emotion, but it's an attitude that motivates action. And just as God's love for man motivated him to activity, true Christian love, agape love, should motivate us to activity as well. Not just any activity we choose, but the activity God has designed for us. It should motivate us to share our faith. To share our faith with the lost and dying world. Directed toward God, that responsibility is, is actively seen in, in obedience. Second John 6 says, This is love that we walk according to his commandments. His, and this is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that we should walk in it. But love directed toward our neighbors is different. It requires that we seek their good in all things. That's our responsibility, to seek the good of our neighbors in everything. Romans chapter 15, verse 2 says, For each of us is to please his neighbor for his good and to his edification. My neighbor's good and my neighbor's edification is my responsibility, and yours is your responsibility, whomever they may be. So who is your neighbor? Well, the Greek word is one that... Uh, According to the lexicon, it literally means one who is nearby, your fellow man. And therefore, the term is not limited just to those to whom we might be warm, warmly inclined or have a, 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 an emotional feeling for. It's, it's a broad term encompassing all humanity. And that doesn't mean we have to be emotionally, feel emotionally warm about everybody we meet. You couldn't possibly do that as a human being. I mean, we meet some people who are obnoxious, do we not? We meet, we meet people who defy you to love them. People who, who you don't even want to be around, really. You just as soon they evaporated, went away, leave you alone. And it, but we don't have to feel warm, in it, warm toward them. But what it does mean is, we have, we, if we, as we have the opportunity, we must behave toward them in a way that is best for them rather than a way that is most convenient for us. Now that comes right down where the rubber meets the road. When we meet people, when we encounter people as we're going places in life, we have a responsibility given to us by God to take every opportunity we get to share the gospel with the unsaved. It doesn't... <clears throat> And that doesn't mean we have to be comfortable in it. We have to do that whether we're comfortable at it or not. People say, I just don't like to, I just don't, I just, I just can't talk to people. Yes, you can. That's a bald-faced lie. You can talk to people. I've seen you doing it tonight. You've been talking to people. We talk to people all the time. Why is it we can talk about, we can talk about the weather, we can talk about world conditions, we can talk about politics, we can talk about sports, we can talk about music, we can talk about a thousand other things. Why is it that we, we think we can't talk about God? What, why is that so difficult? Because they might not like it. They might not be receptive to it. Well, listen. <clears throat> In today's world, if I put it in the political arena, if you're a conservative, you walk up to a liberal and talk to them and see if they're receptive to you. If you're a liberal, walk up to a conservative and talk to them and see if they're receptive to you. They're not going to be. But does that keep you from talking to people? No. No. We talk to people. And we can, we can talk about the gospel. We can talk about God. And we can talk about what God's doing for us. And we can share our testimony. And we can share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What better, more beneficial thing could we do for the unsaved in this world than to share with them the life-changing and, and, and eternity, eternal destiny-setting message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Now, with that in mind, let's turn our attention to the Great Commission. Verse, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Therefore, go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is, this is the passage which is commonly referred to as the Great Commission. It's, 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 a, it's Jesus' charge to his followers to make disciples of all nations. And obviously, we cannot make entire national entities to be disciples of Jesus Christ. I think I'll go out today and, and reach all the, the, the Hungarians. You can't do that. I think I'll go out today and convert Italy. Would God that you could, but you can't. It doesn't work that way. It, we, 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 we cannot possibly convert entire nations. Obviously, we can't do that. Nations comes from the Greek word ethne, which is its root in English word ethnic. And that means God has made the church responsible for reaching every ethnic group on earth. Now it's estimated that there are 650 50 different ethnic groups on the planet. Scattered in 190 nations all over the world, speaking 6,500 different languages. That's a task. No one person can do all that. No one person can take on all that task. I mean, even if you were a master of languages, I'd defy you to learn 6,500 of them. You know? And I'm not a master of languages. Make disciples. Teaching, it, teaching in, in, in the King James, it says, is it's a translated from a Greek word which is an imperative of command. The hub, that's the hub around which the entire, this entire passage turns. It's the hinge upon which the door swings. The words go, make, and baptize, are, are all of them uh, serve to further explain the process involved in making disciples. And they're all three adverbial participles. Therefore, they should properly be translated, having gone, having been sent, or or as, you're, as you, or as you're going, making disciples of, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is an ongoing activity. An ongoing activity. While going, the essential part of making disciples, it's not a com- but that is not the command of act- commanded activity in this passage. This is not a command to go. Do you hear that clearly? It's not a command to go, Go is assumed. Go is assumed. Drive over where you can see two, two, Interstate uh, 215 tomorrow morning about 7.30. See, people are going somewhere. We all go places. We all travel. We all travel around the city. We all travel around the state. We have traveled over the country, and many of us travel around the world. So we're constantly going somewhere. Except during a pandemic <laughs> in California. But we're supposed to be going somewhere. God designed us to be going places. And in this passage, he assumes we are going places. That's the assumption of the passage. It's assumed. Our Lord was not intending to teach disciple making as an activity or a program for the church. But rather a way of life. A way of life. It's supposed to be an everyday activity for every child of God. As we are in the process of going, wherever, for whatever reason, we should be about the business of making disciples. Everywhere we go, we encounter people. And if we just engage them, we might develop an opportunity to share the gospel with them. At the very least, we can try. We can make the effort. And as we're in the process of going, wherever it is, we have to make disciples. Baptizing and teaching indicate, uh, indicate, or in in this case, help to indicate the meaning by which we we make disciples. They help us to understand how true disciples are made. So what did our Lord mean when he commanded his followers make disciples? He meant that true disciples should strive to reproduce themselves. Now, the Apostle Paul stressed that to Timothy, you remember? 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Therefore, my son, 
Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust them to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Evangelism is not a process of addition. It's a process of multiplication. I didn't check it out to see if it's true, and it doesn't sound possible. But I read this afternoon in two places that if you, if you had a penny and you doubled it every day for 31 days, you have millions of dollars. That doesn't sound possible. But do some math. It, once, it, once it gets past a dollar, it starts moving real fast. Yeah. And that's the, the principle with evangelism. If in, over the next year, all of us here, approximately 50 of us, if all of us here in the next year reach just one person, and we teach that person to reach another person, and we next year reach another person, and they reach a person, and we teach them also to reach another then this thing multiplies very rapidly. And pretty soon, tens of thousands of people have gotten saved, and you started the whole process. You start the whole process with just one convert. You start the whole process. And it will work. If the church had been faithful, uh, D. James Kennedy, pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Florida until he died, said once, if the church had faithfully fulfilled the Great Commission, in 10 years the world could have been reached for Christ. 10 years, the whole world could have been Christianized. Our Lord was not intending to teach disciple-making as an activity, but rather a way of life. And for those of us who know Christ as our personal Savior and call ourselves His disciples, it means that we've been sent, and wherever we go while going, we're to be attempting to make disciples. That includes clearly communicating the gospel. What is the gospel? What is the core of the gospel? The core of the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How that Christ died for our sins, Paul said, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15. That may also include some preliminary instruction. You see, the vast majority of our, our, our civilization in this country today, they don't know anything about the nature of God. And in years gone by, that wasn't true. And years gone by, you could talk to someone who did not know the Lord as their personal Savior, did not attend church, and even if, even if those things were true, they still understood something of the nature of God. They understood that God was holy and righteous. They understood sin, and they understood that man was, was sinful. And they understood these preliminary things that, that today we might, we might have to teach them some of those things, instruct them in some of those things. I've met people, adults, who did not recognize the fact that they were sinners, rejected the whole idea that they were sinners. And probably you have too if you've talked to many people. That may also, so it may include some, some very primary instruction. We may have to, 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 to point out to them that God is holy, righteous, and just. And he's established a penalty for sin. That penalty is death. Not just physical death, though that's a part of it, but more than that, eternal separation from God. And man is so depraved that he can't redeem himself. He's as bad off as he could possibly be. He cannot bring himself to, to right. He cannot bring himself to righteousness to, by any means whatsoever, and that means he's dependent upon the grace of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God. And these simple things may, may need to be taught to some of these people before we can even share the gospel with them. Uh, for people to make a commitment to Jesus Christ, they must know some basic truths. You know, this idea, the Apostle Paul could say to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Why could he do that? Did the Philippian jailer not need to know who the Lord Jesus Christ was? Paul could assume in that culture at that time that the Philippian jailer did know who Jesus Christ was. We can't make that assumption. 
We have to clarify that. They don't understand that. So the days when you can just tell people, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, are over. They're over for most people. We have to start more foundationally than that. We have to, to get down to the rudiments of why people are, are lost. They must understand that God, <coughs> that God requires payment for sin. All men, including them, are sinners. And there's absolutely nothing they can do in this life that will pay for their sins. How many people have told you, if you've, if you've talked to people, how many people have told you, I have not nearly enough toes and fingers, and I thank God I don't, to count those who have said to me, that they're, they're, they're doing the best they can. Doing the best they can. I'm not, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm, I'm, I'm more good than bad. Their, their thinking is that somehow God's going to weigh them in, the, in a divine balance scale. And if there's more good than bad, they're going to get into heaven. It isn't going to work that way. It isn't going to work that way. And they have to understand that. Sin separated man from God, and if the penalty is not paid, we'll spend eternity separated from God in hell. And they must understand that Jesus Christ is God. And he became a man without ceasing to be God. See, people today don't understand that. They don't understand the, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. They don't understand that, that God could become a man and still remain God. Because we're men and we're not God. And he gave his life on the cross to pay for, for, for your sins, for the sins of all those who will accept him by faith as their personal Savior and Lord. And once sinners trust Christ, Christ and they're saved and they're secure, and yet they're still not functional disciples. They're still not functional disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple is a learner and follower. A learner and follower. Now, you can't follow until you first what? Learn, right. So there's got to be some learning take place before they can act adequately and properly follow the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's more work to be done. Process continues with baptizing, which is an identification not just with Jesus Christ, not just with the, with the universal church, but with a, with a Bible teaching local assembly. Baptism is therefore the first act of obedience specifically required on the part of a believer and is subsequent or after salvation. And because it is commanded by God and because it is the initial official act of public obedience, baptism is required for local church membership in most churches in America regardless of their denomination. Most of them. God expects every Christian to be affiliated with and, and faithfully attending and participating in the ministry in a biblical local church. Hebrews tells us in 10, verse 10, chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together, as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another. That's the reason it's so important that we not, that we not allow the, the state to close us down, for the long term especially. We need one another. We need mutual encouragement. It's hard to, to, to go it alone in, in this world. It's hard to, to keep the pace in this world as a child of God without the encouragement of other brothers and sisters in Christ. When you have a down day, somebody else can, chat, pat, can, can pat you on the shoulder and give you a word of encouragement. When you come in here in, into church and, and you're having a day, you've had a bad week, Others can be an encouragement to you to, to recognize the fact that not every week is bad. Yeah. Things are going to improve. Things change. And we need one another in that regard. And we minister to one another in that, in that way. And it's imperative that we, that we continue to do so. And God expects us to do so. And then it's the, the assignment of the local church to see that those new converts get deeper instruction in the scriptures so they can grow and mature in their faith and become fully functional members of the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 11 to 14 says, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ until the, we all attain unto the unity of the faith 
in the knowledge of the Son of God, to the mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves that carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. See, while, while, while there may well be teaching required to bring people to the point of, of baptism, the teaching pre- referred to here is that which follows conversion. It comes afterwards. It's the growth process. And the growth process will not be over until you check out. You know, it, it won't be over until you check out. And we're now instructed to teach the unsaved, excuse me, we're not instructed to teach the unsaved to observe the teachings of the Word of God. Don't get on unsaved people's case because they're sinning. Unless they're doing something that's, 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 that's damaging you or damaging other people around them. I mean, in, in, a, in a significant way. Because... There's at least two reasons for that. First of all, righteousness is not a practice that leads to right relationship with God. Righteousness is the product of coming to a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And because it is commanded by God and because it's the initial official act of of public obedience, baptism is is required uh, required of us, but... uh, this issue of, of good works and, and is not to be taught to unsaved people, to unbelievers. They're incapable of fulfilling them, incapable of living that way. Uh, they, they may even come to, the real, come to believe because you confront them regarding their evil deeds. They may even think, if I can just live better, I can go to heaven. And if that were to happen, we've done them a great disservice because that isn't reality. Ephesians 2, 89 says it's by grace that we are saved through faith, that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast or brag. Now, secondly, the unsaved lack the spiritual understanding to grasp the truth of the word of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says the natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God. Have you noticed that? The natural man does not accept the teachings of Scripture. They reject them. They don't want to hear them. For they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. We are able to understand the truths of the Word of God because we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and he guides us into all righteousness. He guides us into the understanding of the truth. He guides us into all truth. And it's because of that we have the ability to learn and understand the Scriptures. That requires teaching, though, with a, with a practical emphasis. Neither learning nor following can be achieved apart from teaching. And if the disciple is, is to learn properly and live properly, he must be taught properly. That's why it is so important that we help those whom we lead to Christ get into a good Bible-teaching church where they can grow in the Lord. Sound doctrine is the only basis of sound practice. That means a newly born Christian must be taught to observe all things, just as Jesus said. The key to discipleship isn't just knowing, it's doing. But in order to do all things rightly, we must know all things, right? Why are you and I I not perfect? Well, partially it's because we don't do what we know. But partially also it's because we don't know all that we should. We're still works in progress. God's still still filing on us a bit. Working on us. Working us over. Therefore our Lord instructed new disciples should be taught to observe all things. Not just taught, but taught to observe. Not just taught to know, but taught to observe. Taught to do something with it. Put it on display. So that others can see it. And serving our Lord is far more than just a mere duty. It is the greatest privilege ever extended to man. To know and serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What greater privilege could we have on this planet than to serve the living God? 
So the Great Commission, God-given charge for disciples to reproduce themselves, has at least three elements. First of all, go, or as you are going. Disciple making is not intended to be an activity uh, or a program in, in, for the local church. It's intended to be a lifestyle, a way of life for every child of God. Secondly, baptizing. And since baptizing is post-conversion or after salvation, an act of obedience and testimony, the observance of the ordinance presupposes that the gospel has been given and a genuine conversion has taken place. Then teaching to observe. Teaching which goes beyond mere acquisition of knowledge and is translated into actions of obedience to that teaching. So the work of making disciples is fairly extensive. It's, it's, a big, it's a big package. But God didn't ask you to take on the whole enchilada. You don't have to eat the whole thing just because it's on your plate. Just eat what you can handle. Do what you can do. And the simplest part of the, of, of, of the process of making disciples is just sharing the gospel. Sharing the good news. You may not be able to teach the deeper, deeper doctrines of the word of God. You may not understand all the prophetic truths of the scriptures. There may be many things you don't understand. But if you're a child of God, you should know the gospel. In fact, if you're a true child of God, you do know the gospel. And if you don't know the true gospel, true gospel you're not a child of God. I'm sorry, but that's reality. That's That's fact. And what we know, we're to share. And we're to, 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 when we encounter unsaved people, we are to take the opportunity that God has given us. You know, when we get up in the morning, we should ask God, God, give me this day one soul I can talk to. One person I can share the gospel with. This isolation we're living in now, we don't have the opportunities we once did. It's a little harder at six feet yeah. And with a mask on. And you know, you can't hear with a mask on. Uh, I, I noticed that this morning. Someone was talking to me this morning, and they took the mask off so they could hear me. I hope it helped. But the work of making disciples is fairly extensive, but... That doesn't mean we must, we must take on the entire responsibility. The simplest and least demanding element of the work is that of sharing the gospel. That of sharing the gospel. You can, you can share the gospel. You can even give some preliminary instruction leading up to the sharing of the gospel with a handful of verses from Scripture. A handful of verses of Scripture. You don't, have to, you don't have to know reams of Scripture. Just a handful. I've never really counted how many I, I would use in a given situation, but I would suggest that 20 verses or less, you can probably cover most everything you have to cover with most people to, to be in a position to share the gospel, and they'd have some possibility, some potential of understanding it. You could, deal, you could deal with the nature of God, the nature of sin, the nature of man, and, and the, character of, the character of Jesus Christ and the doctrine of salvation in 20 verses, I'm sure. Maybe less. So it's not like you have to learn reams and reams of Scripture. And listen, don't be afraid of people asking you questions you can't answer. No one can answer all the questions. No one. I have, there's a guy who comes on the radio on Sunday nights. I hear him occasionally when I leave church. And he would have us believe that he has all the answers. But I've listened to him and he doesn't. You know. He doesn't. And no one else does either. And you take any subject in life. Any, any subject you want to talk about in life. If, if someone can ask if the greatest authority on the planet concerning any subject in life. And there'll be things they don't know. There's no shame in not knowing. Just say, I don't know. You know, the truth is, if you don't know the answer to their question, you're better off in, in when you're witnessing to people, really. 
oftentimes at least, because you don't have to get off track. You, know, you don't have to make excuses. They ask me a question, if I know the answer, I've got to say, well, yeah, well, let's get to that later, okay? And try to stay on track. But if they ask me a question, I don't know the answer, I can just say, I don't know. We'll try to find that out later and move on. And you can do that too. So don't be intimidated by the fact that you don't know everything that you'd like to know of the Word of God. Make use of what you do have. You don't spend your life whining about what you don't have and wishing you had more. Start out using what you've got and then put some effort into adding to it. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's work to study the Bible, it is. But you could be a master, soul winning believer. If you just mastered the Gospel of John, you just master the Gospel of John. All these things we're talking about are in the Gospel of John. That, that I'm talking about things that we, we need to be able, to be able to share with people to, to bring them to a decision for Jesus Christ. They're there. Now, we're going to get into some practical things in, in the weeks to come, but uh, just for tonight, I'll let that go. Maybe that's, that's all we can handle for one night. So let's pray together. Our Father in God, we see very clearly here tonight that you've given us a tremendous responsibility. But it isn't just a responsibility. It's an opportunity to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Father, we praise you and thank you that you've, you've extended that privilege to us. Less than the least of all saints. That you've allowed us, Father, to be your ambassadors in this world. So, Lord God, we pray that we will take to heart the message, the challenge, that we'll take up the challenge, and that we'll be faithful to use what we have while we strive to gain a fuller understanding. In Jesus' name, amen.